let's uh, turn to some of the uh, clinical data. And I want to start with my good friend Jared over here at the other end and, and just kind of make an initial comment, and that is, you know, the year 2015 in lung cancer brought us to PD-1 inhibitors, both nivolumab and pembrolizumab. And I would like to, for you to give us your perspective on, on, on those agents and where they fit in lung cancer at this point. Sure, it's been a very good year for thoracic oncology in 2015. So to bring this to a clinical level, in the clinic, our most common standard second-line therapy prior to these advances that you described was docetaxel, uh, perhaps with the addition of remesurimab as well, but a cytotoxic agent. And I think clinically, docetaxel is a challenging agent. Um, it's a, one of our more, the most toxic agents that we use in thoracic oncology, and efficacy is somewhat limited. And so while it was king of the hill, perhaps it was a king of the hill that we were all looking to dethrone at some point. And we now have two, uh, two agents that have randomized clinical trial going head to head against docetaxel in the second line setting. So the uh, Checkmate 017 study um, was a randomized study of uh, docetaxel, the standard of care, versus the PD-1 uh, antibody nivolumab. And here we saw an improvement in median overall survival from six to 9.2 months. In squamous. In squamous histology, an area where we really have had a dearth of progress in lung cancer. Most of the targeted therapy advances um, that have really revolutionized the care for some of our patients have been pretty restricted to the adenocarcinoma uh, histology. And so yes, there, there was a huge thirst for advances, a huge unmet need for these patients. And that's a very large survival advantage. Now a natural clinical question from a historic perspective in lung cancer would be to ask, okay, but what was the extra toxicity, right? And historically over the decades, our, the experience has been that as we layer on to more and more intense approaches, that toxicity goes up. There were two things remarkable here. One is that in terms of toxicity profile, the newer, better drug uh, was actually quite a bit less toxic. Um, we saw a lot of zeros and ones in the grade three, four uh, toxicity uh, column in a pattern that we're not used to seeing. Now, they're not risk-free drugs. There's still, um, still risks of toxicity. Of course, they're mostly autoimmune since these are immune stimulating drugs. But when compared on a simple level to the alternative, um, I think uh, it's fair to say that they're a whole lot less scary. The other thing that's remarkable from a human perspective was the tail to the curve. So patients don't come to us asking for an extra month of survival. Of course they'll take it over not having it, who wouldn't? But what patients really want is a chance at being alive um, counting uh, many months or years down the road. And in that trial, the 18 month survival was improved uh, from 13% with docetaxel uh, to 28% with nivolumab. And so from a human perspective, you know, this is what our patients are asking for. This is what our patients care about. So we better care too. And this was a very, uh, very meaningful improvement. Now the second trial that's important in this realm was the non-squamous trial of the same agent. So this was nivolumab versus docetaxel, still second line, uh, but this time for non-squamous patients. And this is the Checkmate 57 uh, trial. Their median survival was improved from 9.4 to 12.2 months, and again, the tail to the curve was improved. Um, one year survival went from 39 to 51%. Very similar trial has been done uh, with pembrolizumab. In this case, patients were not selected uh, by uh, histology. They were instead selected by PDL1 uh, status. They had to be PDL1 positive, but both squamous and non-squamous patients were allowed on this trial. And again, survival was improved from 8.2 to 14.9 months. So we have a less toxic drugs or less toxic class of drugs with better median survivals uh, and uh, better tails to the curve. This is a major advance for our patients. So it tastes great and is less filling, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, no, I, I agree. I, I think the impressive aspect of those is, is obviously the efficacy, but um, I was actually impressed in the phase three setting large number of patients, how well tolerated and how um, infrequent the immune-related adverse events were with these agents, what you got to the phase three. So I, I think it's, a, it's obviously a win-win. One more point uh, might be worth making about the nivolumab trials. Um, these were trials were unselected by pdl one status, but they did give us the subgroup data later um, of the level of uh, staining that was present uh, in uh, tumor cells. And it was remarkable that there was no class of pdl one status that did not benefit. Um, 
So across those, uh, across the, those standing levels, uh, patients did better with nivolumab. But, but now pembrolizumab is associated with a companion diagnostic, whereas nivolumab has a complementary diagnostic. That's right. So what this looks like in practice um, in the office is that in the second line, you can give nivolumab without knowing the pdl one status. Um, and I think that's pretty fair based on the phase three that data that existed. The negative predictive value wasn't there to deny anyone the PD-1 therapy. In contrast, pembrolizumab requires at least 1% staining with the 22C3 antibody. Um, and there you might ask, well, wh why would you ever bother? Um, and the practical answer is that pembrolizumab is in every three-week drug, where nivolumab is in every two-week drug. So you, you, you used to be my uh, boss down south, mm -hmm. and you know that our average tra uh, travel distance was hours. Yes. Um, for that kind of population, uh, an every three-week drug can be more convenient.